that was the experience that I went through. I reached the point of burnout um, and coming out of the other side of that, um, having tried to sort of rest and recover, I realized that actually I needed to rethink uh, my relationship with work. You're listening to episode 18 of the Happy Space podcast. Today, we're talking about a movement towards individualized work with the authors of Work Style, a revolution for well-being, productivity, and society with co-authors and fellow sensitive folk, Lizzie Penny and Alex Hurst. Welcome to the Happy Space Podcast, where we talk about designing inclusive performance through the lens of a highly sensitive productivity catalyst. Uh, that's me, executive coach, speaker, and brand collaborator, Claire Kumar. Join conversations with authors, culture shapers, space designers, and creators of products, services, and customer experience as we highlight astonishing contributions tempting a more tender world. We know that diversity leads to richer results, so let's accept that productivity is personal and commit to designing with respect for humanity. I aim to leave you with ideas to better support your family, colleagues, customers, community, and not least of all, yourself. For everyone, including you, deserves a happy space. Together, we can create a happier, more fulfilled society through a world of work without bias. This is how the book Work Style, A Revolution for Well-Being, Productivity, and Society opens. Written by two fellow HSPs, Alex Hurst and Lizzie Penny, they immediately invite us to be part of a movement to radically redesign work so that more people can contribute. You know that I am so totally aligned with this, so you can imagine how excited I was when I found this book. It brings us through the journey of work from the establishment of the eight-hour workday right up to the 40-hour work week, and now to today's desired autonomy. Alex and Lizzie put this to the test with the creation of a company called Hawksby, a company that is committed to work style and enabling their stable of freelancers to work wherever and whenever they choose. So we explore the demographic, economic, and social justice reasons why this redesign is necessary. Tune in and find out why they dis flexible work and how they talk about the relationship between autonomy and accountability. I really hope you enjoy meeting these two thought leaders, Lizzie and Alex, who are really ready to push us into a new world of work. Enjoy. Today's episode of the Happy Space podcast is sponsored by ClaireKumar.com. With sensitivity, curiosity, and courage, I serve three groups asking the tough questions that lead to meaningful answers. Number one, I coach ambitious leaders to design for well-being and achieve next-level work-life integration. Number two, I mic drop thought bombs that's BALMS as in B-A-L-M-S, in keynotes and workshops, helping organizations achieve the business imperative that is inclusivity. And three, I collaborate with brands concerned with respect for well-being on product design, marketing, and PR. If any of this piqued your interest, come find me at clairekumar.com. I'd love to speak with you. Designing inclusive performance together will lead to the richest results. Alex and Lizzie, welcome to the Happy Space Podcast. I'm so thrilled to have two fellow HSPs join me and HSPs who are not just, you know, recognizing the trait, regulating their own world, advocating for what they want, that have moved into the activate phase, which is really moving to change the world. And uh, Alex and Lizzie, as you know from the intro, have written work style, and I have so many questions for you. The first one is actually, I'll start with high sensitivity and ask you, maybe I'll start with you, Alex, because I first read in the book, I think it's page 32, where you say, you mention you come out as, as being highly sensitive. Uh, I'll start with you. How did 
your sensitivity shape or inform your journey to get to where you are now? Um, well, hi, Claire. Thank you um, for having us. Um, yeah, I thought it was important, uh, I think, firstly, to to call out um, high sensitivity in the book, um, because I think it's it's not very well known nor understood and yet affects a huge number of people. Um, so for me, that was important, uh, which is to acknowledge that um, we're all different, but also the, the more that we understand ourselves, the more we can shape our work environments and our work styles to bring out the best in us. And, you know, for me, that is uh, one aspect, one of many aspects uh, to what makes work style so exciting, uh, but also so necessary and relevant because we're all individual, we're all different, and we all have um, uh, personal needs that work needs to fit around. And up until this point, um, those personal needs have had to take a back seat to the needs of, and the pressures of our jobs that, that we have to be done uh, nine to five, Monday to Friday in most cases. Um, for me, it was, uh, it was that kind of hours based, um, same place, um, same hours, in fact, lo longer hours uh, yeah. that ultimately led to, uh, to burnout. And I, and I think highly sensitive people are probably more prone to burnout. In fact, I think they are statistically more prone to burnout. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that was the experience that I went through. I reached the point of burnout. Um, and coming out of the other side of that, um, having tried to sort of rest and recover, I realized that actually I needed to rethink uh, my relationship with work to be not based on how much time I spent doing it. I, I always rationalized my value as a worker based on the number of hours I put into doing it rather than what that work was actually achieving. And yeah, so that and was some, the big, and, yeah, some yeah, leaders, big realization. Yeah. Leaders can often value the, the uh, derriere in the chair <laughs> for the butts. And exactly. Seats, right. It's like, exactly. if I don't see you working, how could you possibly be working? Yeah. Um, yeah. And that yeah. was the thing that kind of, for me, it made me think, okay, so if it's not about you know, how many hours uh, and the input, and it's about the output, then I can, I can change the way I work. So I don't have to go to the same place every day and work the same hours every day, but in fact, choose workspace and time best fits the type of work I'm doing in order to get the best output. Um, and that's kind of what took me to a conversation in the pub with Lizzie as was <laughs> to come up with the idea of work style where which is where we had our meeting of minds really which is about that shift to output value rather than input yeah like results results only work right but yeah. we haven't been able to look at the the work design uh and all the all the symptoms that come out of it, it we really really know about, need to go back to designing lizzie any comment from you on high sensitivity uh as well I think um, yeah, I think for me, Alex and I both went on a bit of a voyage of discovery at the same time um, with high sensitivity. Mm. Um, Alex came across it when he had children and said, look, I think I'm this. I think you might be too. And um, I, I read it and I just thought, yep, I think I am. And I think one of my children is as well. And I think it explained a lot about my life. But I think mm -hmm. one of the things that really um, has had a profound impact on me is the sense of injustice on behalf of other people. And I think I feel that really acutely. So in the book, we talk about seven excluded groups. So seven groups who are fundamentally and structurally excluded from work, yeah. older workers, carers, those with chronic illness, physical disability, mental health challenges, um, those who are neurodiverse and parents. And I think I feel really acutely the sense of injustice on behalf of those people that they aren't able to be involved in work. And I have, since we started Hoxby, experienced a number of those things myself, including having breast cancer and seen firsthand how working during cancer treatment is something really different from being a happy, healthy person. And similarly with children, you know, working around children. It just doesn't fit nine to five, five days a week, 50 weeks a year. 
Um, and so I think it's a kind of combination of me always having really empathized with those people, but also now having personally experienced it myself. Now there's your high sensitivity, empathy trait showing up, right? Yeah. This is partly why I'm so excited to be talking to fellow HSPs, because not only do you connect the dots with what you see around, then there's this movement from empathy into active compassion and actually doing something about it, which just delights me to no end. My personal journey was not, I didn't have the language around high sensitivity. So this is part and part mm -hmm. why I'm talking about a lot and why I was very excited to see you name it in the book as well, is I didn't have this language. So I, the episode one of my podcast, I talk about falling down the stairs in 2007 and I was still in the corporate world and I was don't ever do this. Patty Hills and Birkenstocks. Bad combination, <laughs> right? So yeah, I enjoyed bad. that. I enjoyed that. <laughs> don't, don't, don't do that, right? And so I realized then something needs to shift. And I love that you, when you look at work style, the one word, and I love that it's one word, it's instead of lifestyle, we have work style and we get to design our lifestyle so we get to design our work style. So we, we have this sense of this is really about autonomy. And I love the, the, the exploration of etymology in the, in the book of the brilliant sort of how did we get from uh, work and all its evolutions to where are we now and, and why are we dealing with this system? But autonomy itself, I wonder if you can talk just a little bit about that and Relating it to, you know, we've been through the pandemic and coming through, I would say, the pandemic. More people are in touch with the autonomy that's been serving them. So what are we on the cusp of in terms of our global population? And I think you said one billion knowledge workers. Yeah, yeah. Um, this is really at the heart of the revolution that we think is, is coming. Um, uh, to your point, um, during the pandemic, people experienced a far greater freedom. Uh, and yet, for the most part, were locked down and confined to their homes, which is, um, I <laughs> guess, ironic. Um, but the, the, the freedom came from, um, at, you know, as things changed, you know, being able to remain at home whilst, um, you know, pick, taking kids to school, picking them up as, by way of example. So they started yeah. to experience some of that freedom. And with that, and the uh, working from from home or during lockdown, the uh, the accountability to deliver, regardless of being in the office or or working nine to five. So there was a taste of that autonomy there, albeit yeah. under extreme circumstances. And in fact, uh, autonomy was still very highly restricted at that point. You had to work from home rather than working from anywhere. And there's a big difference between those two things. Uh, being confined to your home if you don't have uh, an office space or you do have animals or, um, you know, pets and people and whatever buzzing around can be difficult challenges. It's not the same thing. Yeah. Um, but there've been lots of research over the years into autonomy and work. And the research has proved, uh, a number of times over that autonomy is better for, uh, better for, for people's uh, mental health. It reduces stress. It, it, is better for staff retention and it's better for productivity. Uh, but for the most part, it hasn't really been something that organizations have known how to give. And so the pandemic almost it said, okay, help give how you give it to an extent. And so that was a great kind of awakening. Yeah. Um, but actually autonomous working uh, is something that we've been pioneering since 2015 with the word work style which is a word that was that we created because it didn't exist. People didn't have the language to talk about their personal preference of when and where they work such mm -hmm. that it fits around their lifestyle. But it's a word that we needed because we could now work from anywhere and at any time. And it's a word that's enabling anyone who uses it and anyone who reads the book to, to start to take control of something that was previously believed to be out of their control to control when and where you work. You can now have a word for it and we can all have a word for it and talk, talk about it with one another in a way that we couldn't before. Yeah. 
And so all that's really enabling is for us to take advantage of the, the opportunity that's already here, that technology is already giving us and that the pandemic has opened our eyes to, mm -hmm. which is to liberate us from the shackles of nine to five, Monday to Friday mindset and enable us to start exploring our own preference and work with more autonomy. And if we can do that, yeah. then the benefits are huge. So we've done our own research in Hoxby, which is the company we created to test work style uh, yeah, back in 2015. So eight years of practical experience, but also four years of, de of research into the people who are working to their own work styles, which proved a link between autonomy and productivity, which is well-being. So by being able to choose our own, I mean, it makes sense, right? It's pretty obvious, but hate the data now backs it up, <laughs> yeah. which is greater autonomy increases your well-being and therefore your productivity. So it's, it's better for, for our work. It's better for our well-being. And it's also better for society, which we can come on to talk about um, in terms of enabling individuals to access work on their own terms. Mm -hmm. And that's the really exciting part of this revolution. Absolutely, it is. Now, you talk in the book about hybrid work and flexibility, and you diss them a little bit. Um, I wonder if, Lizzie, you want to jump in on this one and help me understand why it's not good enough to be just talking about hybrid work. It's not good enough to be talking about flexible work. Can you, can you tell me why that is? We do diss it a little bit. I think at one point we actually say flexible working is our nemesis, um, which is probably a little cruel um, because, you know, any progress is good progress, mm. but not if it's going to hinder a giant leap forward that we feel that we should be making. So I guess that our, our main concerns with flexible working would be threefold. So firstly, it's flexing around an outdated system fundamentally it still relies on nine to five five days a week to flex around it's called flexible around those times now the eight hour working day is 200 years old more than 200 years old it was invented by the great social reformer sir robert owen or sir bobby o to those of us who are mega fans um more than 200 years ago and at the time it was really progressive um but we think he'd be turning in his grave to know that People are still working that way now. And the five-day working week, that was first conceived of by Henry Ford 100 years ago. So, you know, more recent, but still very old thinking. So we feel that it's flexing around an outdated industrial age system and that it requires that to exist, where we feel that the whole system should be ripped up and we need to start again in a new way of working that's fit for the digital age we live in. The second thing is it creates in-group, out-group dynamics. Mm. And... That is really to say that as long as the prevailing way of working is still nine to five, five days a week, anyone who works differently to that or for whom that isn't their perfect way of working will be considered an outsider or in somehow some way special or different. And I think that includes HSPs as well. Oh, yeah. Many, certainly many HSPs. Absolutely. Um, yeah. And we really need um, a new system of work and a, a new word for it, obviously, we, we feel strongly about that, that fundamentally levels the playing field so that everyone can work in an individualized way rather than the people who work full time and the people who work part time. And, and with that, there are, you know, there's negative connotations in language as well. You know, part timers, shirking from home, flex pest, you know, a lot of negativity. And that's part of the reason we felt we needed something neutral like work style. And then the third thing is, that for many, many groups, flexible working and hybrid working and remote work just isn't creating change fast enough or, in fact, at all for some groups. So there was some research in the UK on neurodiversity, and we, we look in the book at gap statistics. So the gap between the number of people who want to work and the people who do. 77% of people with autism want to work, but only 26% yeah. do. That's what we say in the book. That Actually, now they believe it's only 22% of people mm. with autism who do. So that gap is actually widening. So I think that actually flexible working isn't serving the purpose that it should. It's 70 years old and it's time that we came up with something completely different that's fit for the age we live in. And we think that's work style. Oh, I'm, I, I drink the Kool-Aid. Um, 
<laughs> I, want, I want to come back to your, your comment about language because I just read the International Labor Organization's report and was able mm -hmm. to do some media interviews around it. And it was interesting looking at it. When you look at a global view of work, you know, 35% of people are still working 48 hours or more. When we look at the, how it's spread around the world, it blew my mind. Their definition in the report of part-time work was anything under 35 hours. And I, my jaw dropped. I just thought, oh, oh my gosh, that actually is probably an ideal full plate as a productivity thinker and to what the human brain can actually take on. I'm like, five, six hours a day, plenty, you know? Well, but, so, yeah. But also, yeah. aren't we centralizing work with some people having to work a huge amount and mm. some people who want to work not being able to work Absolutely. at all? Absolutely. And this is marginalized. Something that, you know, we've been working on this for five years pre-pandemic, but I think the pandemic has really accelerated the conversation. In the UK, um, there was a report called the Taylor Review that was done in 2017 that was a report on good work, what good work is. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't, it doesn't mention autonomous work as a route to bring people into work at all. Mm -hmm. And I think that shows just how rapidly things have changed. Um, and that there are people out there looking for a new approach, but they just don't quite know what it is. Oh, oh absolutely. So, so I'm a trained executive coach. And one of the things we do as a, as a coach is kind of try to meet people where they are. <laughs> oh, I get this vision and this is a massive shift and, and step level change. What do you say to a leader who's listening, who says, wow, that sounds, sounds great, but you know, understand this idea of redefining the psychological contract with work. But what do we actually do? How do we get at this with actual legal contracts? How do we design this around benefits? And how do I, how do I wrap my head around this practically? What would you offer to that? I and mean, maybe Alex, you want to take this one. Sure. Um, well, so when we came up with the idea of work style, um, we didn't want it to just be a word and an idea. We wanted it to be something that we understood intimately enough to write a book about it. Um, and we knew that eventually we would write a book and the, the pandemic gave us the much needed um, kick to get it done. Uh, but we wanted to know how it worked in practice. So Hoxby is almost a blueprint, if you like, for us to take to those leaders and say, look, this yeah. is how it could be done. You know, in, in the purest form, here's an organization where Every person has the freedom to decide their own work style. And culturally, that is uh, the norm. And here's how we've built the business. I won't go into the specifics of it now. There are three fundamental shifts that leaders need to make in order to start to wrap their heads around it. The first is that work should be assumed as being done digitally first rather than physically. Mm -hmm. so much of the way that work gets done is, is actually done through messaging platforms as an evolution to emails that went before, but you know, people would sit in offices and email the person next to them. So the reality is that that's been happening for quite a long time, mm -hmm. but we still leaders, uh, and, and people, because we're conditioned by it, still believe we have to be in the same physical space, uh, first and foremost to work together when actually c collaboration happens first digitally. That enables people to, to work from anywhere. Um, but the second thing is that we need to assume that work is done asynchronously rather than synchronously. So rather than assuming we need to be having a conversation in real time, assuming that actually the conversation will happen not in real time, it'll happen asynchronously so that people can access the conversation on their terms more people can access the conversation because it's happening asynchronously. And we're not relying on meetings, therefore, to communicate our ideas, but actually we're having conversations through messaging or exchanging of videos. This is happening increasingly now. There's a, just, so, just to pause on that point, because I think that's such, it's happening, but it's a fundamental mindset shift to think about, I, what do you mean I don't get to have someone in synchronous conversation? That mm. means a reskilling and upskilling around intention and patience yes. and communication, thoughtfulness, conciseness, yes. clarity. Like 
there's a lot of training and a lot of development here to bring everyone's skill up to be able to do this. Yes. And this, these mindset shifts that I'm talking about are principal mindset shifts to enable the future of work. There are a whole host of skill sets that need to be developed fall out of them. Yeah. But what they enable by way of benefit is access to a wholly more diverse workforce. So Lizzie talked about the number, the people who could be included that currently are, but it also accounts for individual working uh, preferences. It accounts for introvert versus extrovert personalities, for example, who can access a conversation and give a concise and considered view as you described in a way that they perhaps wouldn't if they were in a, a meeting room environment having the same discussion. Yeah. So, so the skills are there. The mindset needs to be there. And this, yeah. and this, um, you talk about it being an antidote to bias. And I know we're going to come back to point number three. I'm not going to leave listeners yep. hanging there. Um, That's okay. But this, this antidote to bias in the construct, there's a whole lot of learning because I see challenges around at like every level, which as someone who teaches this, it's like, whoo, lots of opportunity. But, but yeah. do you think, um, I, uh, let's t- talk about number three, and then I want to come to where we are and the journey sort of yeah. forward, bringing people along that. So yes, please finish with the yeah. third reason. So digital asynchronous and then... Digital asynchronous. And, and then the third one is trust versus presence. So having, um, b- building a relationship on the basis of trust rather than needing to see people. It's like we were saying before, um, mm. you, you know, that there's an expectation that to know that someone's working, you have to be able to see them sitting at their desk tapping keys. Yeah. When the reality is that's not the case. Uh, a more a more adult um, basis for collaboration is one built on trust, and that is also a huge mindset shift for people. Which is to say, I don't need to see you uh, to know you're working, or, or to trust that you're going to deliver mm-hmm. what we've agreed you're going to deliver. So, those three things are huge things to get your head around as a leader. But as we said, they're the things that can unlock not only the potential of, of a wider workforce, uh, yeah. but also therefore the benefit of that um, diverse workforce, the collective intelligence of the group yeah. goes up and businesses can benefit from, from that enormously. There's, there's the skill building around how to build trust and, I mean, and the mindset shift that it's possible to start, but then the skill building is there anything in particular that you're doing at Hawksby that in, is intentionally building trust in a group of people that may never actually be in the room together? I like, think this is this is so interesting because this is what we've been experimenting with for the last eight years. And there's a whole host of things that we're doing. Mm. But I think we recognize um, a couple of key things. Firstly, trust needs to be role modeled by leaders. At the very top, you need to see trust all the time. Um, and I think leaders actually are the ones who are most reticent. They say, well, I need to be there so people can see me. Well, what if you're not? What does that look like? How well, are you present and connecting with people if you're not physically in the same place, which Alex and I have had for the entirety of Hoxby's um, yeah. lifetime? Yep. The second thing is about recognition. So praising those people who work in a trust-based way. And sometimes that might mean having trust to fail and learn from it and and recognizing that. And then the third thing is rewarding. Them. So the people who work that way are the ones who progress, get more responsibility, et cetera, et cetera. So I think there's there's that element. I think the other thing is that with this way of working, we often say you need to invest in those three areas, by which we mean time, energy, and money. This doesn't happen overnight. Mm. And I think what we saw during the pandemic was, yes, everyone suddenly had to work from home. What they did was they took the way they worked in the office and they translated it to home. They were on Zoom calls all day instead of in meetings yeah. all day. Whereas our recommendation to anyone seriously thinking of adopting this is you need an upfront piece of thinking about how does this best work in your organization. And then you need to train in three different ways. You need to train individuals in how to work this way. You need to train teams in how they can work as a group. Mm -hmm. And you need to train leaders because leadership in this model is completely different from leadership in a presence-based organization. 
Yeah. So that, and, that brings us back to how do we bring people along? Alex, go ahead. Yeah, well, I was just going to say at the heart of the requirement for that change is two centuries of conditioning to the way it's been done up until now. Mm -hmm. And I think we forget that, you know, we're used to working this way. Uh, it's, 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 it's been uh, an immutable reality for generations. And we've got to go easy on ourselves a little bit here because of that. But times have now fundamentally changed to the point at which we do need to revolutionize the way we work, to change it completely. But go easy on ourselves for the fact that this is right at the, we are right at the start of this time, this digital age, yeah. but it isn't going away. Our future is digital. Our ways of working are going to be digitally led. And so we need to evolve with that. If we don't evolve, then we are doing ourselves a disservice uh, as a species. And mm. I would add even more to that, that for organisations who don't evolve and who go back to the office, hybrid working, stick with flexible, they will find they are missing out on a source of competitive advantage. Mm. It's something that Alex and I feel really strongly about, that your ways of working are something that creates competitive advantage. They're not something just to hand over to the HR department to, to be in charge of. They should be squarely in the middle of the CEO's responsibility because this can fundamentally shape who you have in your organization, how you retain them, how you bring people together, how you leverage diversity. Um, and we know that that leads to better outcomes. Yeah. So I, on LinkedIn recently, I, I uh, was reacting to Starbucks and uh, mandating people to come back two plus one days, right? And I'm like, mm. what if you told your customers you must order at least a venti? Otherwise, yeah. just, you know, there's nothing for you here, right? It's yeah. like... Yeah. Do we and, not have, do we not offer, do we not recognize people want individualized drinks? <laughs> so, yeah, it's ridiculous. Exactly. It, it comes back to what you're saying about how do you engender trust? Mm -hmm. Well, well, it, you, you're going to struggle to engender trust if you are mandating anything. Right. Because actually, if you're mandating, you've got to be here two days, or you're instantly compromising someone's autonomy, yeah. restricting their, their, their trust in uh, the organization. So yeah. anything that involves a mandate is going to limit autonomy. And that's, that's really at the crux of where leadership has to evolve. So there's a tug of war out there right now with this idea of, yes, I can embrace this individual needs and flexibility. And I just, somebody I respect yesterday just came back to me on LinkedIn and said, I think flexibility has gone too far. And I was like, oh, no, 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 no. Mm. Um, I think the question here is, and I think it's worth touching on when you when you talk about the way Hoxby works, you talk about projects with deadlines and you talk about, you know, there is some structure here. It's not everybody decides, oh, I'm coming in whenever I want. There is can you can you maybe reassure listeners out there who are thinking that it's a complete free for all? What do you what do you anchor in? I think we would say uh, that we did try the free for all and it can be a touch chaotic. And, and, you know, we, we speak to organizations all the time who say, well, what if I want, uh, my individuals within my organization, they want to know what they should be doing. You know, this, mm -hmm. this master servant relationship doesn't just disappear overnight. Employees want to impress. They want to know what you should be doing. We recommend that any organization consider three elements, their authentic purpose, because that's the thing that really connects people to your organization, motivates mm. them to be really committed. The second thing is culture, which, you know, goodness, we could talk about that all day, but having a community culture of effective, empowered, but fully distributed teams. And then the third thing is an agile structure. And the agile structure is about adaptable, but resilient uh, tech combinations of technology that mean and the structure to your organization that mean you facilitate a digital first asynchronous approach but that everyone is really clear about what they're doing when so you're you're or not necessarily when but what they're doing for what so or instance, by when by yeah. when has to be clear exactly everyone has to be clear on and we start all our projects with work style in mind so mm. you curate a team based on who can deliver what when Everyone's accountable right. for that. Everyone at Hoxby knows Slack is our office and yeah. we communicate through Slack. 
do not send an email. We have a no emails rule at Hoxby. Mm. All, all the work we produce is produced on Google Suite. That's where you go to collaborate to produce work. So I think for us, you know, we're constantly keeping an eye on technology and actually technology has really helped us. We would have liked to have started this organization before 2015, mm. but the technology wasn't there to facilitate it. Yeah. Um, and we're always looking at what new elements of technology there are, but you need to purposely design those elements of your organization to make sure that they underpin this way of working. I know you want to say something, and, Alex. Oh, itching, <laughs> itching. Lizzie's absolutely right and covered off everything from a from a organizational point of view. But the one thing, that, and she touched on it as well, for people is that you can't have autonomy without accountability. They go hand in glove. So you're, you're accountable for your output, your work, for meeting your deadlines. And that's far better than being accountable for showing up at nine um, uh, and staying till five. But accountability it's different. for the output. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And fundamentally, that you, people can be trusted yeah. to, to do that. They understand that there's a trade-off between autonomy and accountability. It comes naturally. Yeah. So there is, as long as there is clarity, as Lizzie says, about the, the infrastructure and, the, and the, the terms of engagement, people can be trusted to deliver. And they understand that with autonomy comes accountability. And so it works yeah. very well in that sense. Love, I love how you added that that bit of rigor to it, which becomes something to bounce off. I talk about having a trampoline with the right tension, so you're not mm. sinking to the bottom and hitting your feet, or you're not, and you're not, you know, taking off to the moon. So it's it's figuring out what that is. Yeah, Alex, go ahead. You. I feel like I could just keep talking, unfortunately, which is probably not helpful. But we were very fortunate, and we understand how fortunate we we were to be able to design a business with work style as the operating principle uh -huh. organizations now are trying to change from yeah. very traditional ways of working and a culture built in that into something different um but i think probably what's what's exciting or, or probably where we're at is that the things they're exploring now post-pandemic hybrid type solutions are a middle ground a stepping stone towards a more autonomous feature of work. They're mm. almost like hybrid cars on the journey to all electric. You know, it's a, it's a pro, it's a process. Um, but uh, we're excited that the the destination is is radically different from from where we've been. I love that you talk about Unilever and their project. You work. Um, I wonder if there's anything there that could be shared that you might expand upon as a potential, you know, beacon for an organization that, yes, is already working traditionally, but has taken up an area of work. And I know stories from Unilever that are not like this and progressive. They're a burnout and conference calls at four in the morning, you know. But um, what, can you, what can you share a bit more about that? And maybe even the contract part of work, like how are we, how are we dealing with benefits? What are we actually, how are we, what's the, what is the contract there? Um, I think it's one of the things that really sticks with me about the you work case study in the book is that almost a third of the Unilever workforce in the UK are going to reach retirement age in the next five years. And we have an aging demographic globally yeah. that is one of the key catalysts for us needing to change to this way of working. It's becoming a business priority um, because of that. You know, $3.5 trillion could be added to the OECD economies simply by encouraging older workers to stay in the workforce for longer. So there's a massive need to do this. And actually, if we yeah. don't do it, there simply won't be enough people in the workforce to do all the work that well, needs and, to be And we need doing. to fund our longevity now. It's, well, it's, exactly. We're going to run out if we don't we keep are. working. We are. Yeah. And in any country where the nation state can't fund pensions and social care, and yeah. where families and communities can't provide the support they need, which realistically they can't, yeah. the practical reality is that people will simply have to keep working for longer to remain financially oh, yeah. independent. In, in the book, you talk about worried about the UK's productivity and GDP. Just yep. yesterday, I, I watched a video with Bill Morneau, who was our finance minister, saying, I'm worried about Canadian productivity. I'm worried yeah. about this, yeah. this element of what, what we're able to actually accomplish. Well, and in the UK, we have a labour market crisis, you know, that mm. um, we have record low levels of unemployment. And we're looking at, we actually were at the House of Parliament last week 
talking to the UK government about how they can include more people in work through adopting more autonomous working. So I think partly the Unilever case study shows that there is a genuine business need for huge businesses to whereby flexible and hybrid just won't be enough. They need to do something more radical. I think the other thing is that Hoxby is a freelance community because we believe that that's where you can get that true autonomy Mm. and the true accountability. But we have a vision for this to be the predominant way of people working. And we cannot adopt that vision without large organizations also coming more towards work style working. Mm. So that's something that Alex and I are squarely focused on as a a kind of output of the book. Mm -hmm. He's starting to talk to lots of these organizations and for us to learn as we do about how they can adopt work style working in a way that best suits them. And, you know, We're talking to a high-end fashion house at the moment, one of the world's biggest food producers, you know, radically different organizations who each have different characteristics that they need to make sure they're protecting whilst also adopting more progressive working practices. It's such an exciting time, especially when you realize the pressures we're under. If we can, you know, have that perspective on of looking at not just the next three months and hitting those targets, but really stepping back and saying, what do we need to do? We're really, we really need this um, work style revolution that you talk of. Um, I've got a couple of lighter questions just to close out our interview because I noticed your word emojis right off. I'm like, what is this thing? <laughs> right, right at the beginning, yeah. then you explain it. Um, just because it's, all the way peppered through the book and such a neat concept. And I'm a big emoji fan. Uh, I, I would love you to share this element that you've incorporated in the book, if you could explain it. And then mm-hmm. I have one other question for you. Sure. So uh, we're not sure what's getting more traction uh, with the media, the word work style or the word word emoji, which we made yes. up for. Word emoji is when you're uh, conversing in Slack, for example, yeah. To add an emoji, you would type colon and then start typing the word uh, and the, and it would come up with whatever the associated emoji is. Right. So when it, it's a cultural thing, I think for people who are used to working uh, in Slack and tr- quickly trying to access emojis, you would start with colon and type the associated word. So we weren't able to print actual emojis in the book, which was where the original idea came from, because that's how we speak in a kind of digital first environment. It's how we convey humor right. and character and personality. But we wanted to, um, but the publisher wasn't able to to help us with that. So we did the next best thing, which was to put the sort of the word form of the emoji in instead. And in many cases, we actually took some creative liberties and just made up uh, whatever we thought the emoji might be. Exactly. And and I love that peppered through then is there's a sense of personality, there's a sem- sense of uh, whimsy, and and there aren't emojis for everything that was in there. So I thought you had then free license. I do it with hashtags, which mean things yeah. only to me. I have, exactly. I have one, you'll love this one. Autonomy is for adults. So hashtag autonomy is for adults. Hashtag oh, flexibility nice. is mm. inclusivity. So nice. Yeah. Um, nice. And hashtag productivity is personal. These are ones that I've been using on LinkedIn for quite a long time now. And they're going to be on T-shirts because I think we need awesome. to get this, this kind of feeling out. Now, I have one last question for you. I've loved this conversation. Um, first of all, is there anything else that I've missed that you want to share before we wrap? And then I'll ask you the last question because I know there's an explanation here, too. I don't think so. I mean, we, as you can tell, we could go on talking about this for hours and hours, but I would just say to anyone who's interested, read the book and let us know what you think. Yes. You include how to reach you there and we'll include it in the show notes as well. And workstylerevolution.com is the website, I believe. Now, my question is, as someone born in England and with great affinity for uh, England, when I go to the underground in Mm -hmm. London, I see a symbol that looks remarkably like work style, but it's like the the a, the symbol is is like an underground but broken. Does this mean yes, exactly? Does that mean no more commute? What is that? What, oh, is, what does that mean? What? There is so symbol. much subliminal meaning to this, but that uh-huh. wasn't one of them. But we're going to add it in. Going to add that in now. That's what I. That's what I thought. This is no more underground. It came from 
um, the, that we call that re the refresher. And it came my from, favorite candies. From it came yeah. from. <laughs> sorry, yes, those are also good. It did, <laughs> it didn't come from the candies. It came <sighs> from in your web browser yes. when you refresh. Yes, there's that little um, arrow, and our oh. uh, Hoxby, our tagline is refreshing work, and so that's where the uh, the refresher came from. But it's time to refresh. It the, also the is time. Work to stop commuting on a crowded tube at peak yeah. rush hour. Good God, yes. Yeah. It's the uh, it's the symbol of our revolution now. And, yes. you know, it is literally a revolution, a revolving circle. So, yeah, yeah. that's kind of where it came from. Um, but, yeah, hopefully it'll be the end of the commute as well. Yeah. That's, that's why I, I think I know what this is. No, I, I didn't, but I, I, amazing. I knew there would good. be thought you behind it. You've given us an idea, actually. I think we should do some sort of campaign with the tube, uh, tube signs all around London, placing them with refreshers. It could be fun. Could be fun. I'm, you guys have bought so much thought, so much research and insight into the book. I urge everyone to pick up a copy if you're looking at redesigning work, because that's what this is. And uh, it goes through things that you're going to think about if this is for you, things about that you're going to want to think about if you're a leader and if you're really concerned about benefiting society in the long term. There are points to be paid attention to here that you you can't unsee is one of the things that I'm saying a lot now. You can't unsee the benefits that we've had and where we need to go. So Lizzie and Alex, thank you immensely for joining me. And I uh, I would love to have you back as I know you're going to be exploring this more. And when you've got more to say about, you know, maybe your first organization that says we're going to pilot a work style team, right? I can yeah. just, I sense this absolutely taking off and I'd love to further the conversation anytime. Amazing. Thank That'd you be so great. much We'd for having us. We'd love to do us. that. Yes, thank you, Claire. Oh, you're so welcome. Thank you so much for listening. You can find all of the Happy Space Podcast episodes over at happyspacepod.com. That is also where you'll find a link to our online community. Please leave a review over at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you tune in. And if you liked what you heard, please share. After all, doesn't everyone deserve a happy space? <laughs>